Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. First, let me begin by saying, if you'd like to access closed caption, please press the CC at the bottom of your screen. I'll give you a moment to do so. Pressing the CC will allow closed caption mean for you if you would like that and it should appear. Thank you to our closed captioners. My name is Lisa Coleman and I am the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation. I use she and her pronouns. As always, I have to thank the amazing team in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation here at NYU, some of whom are on the line right now in the background. I am thrilled to work with you every day. It is an honor and it is a pleasure. Thank you for all that you do for NYU, for the office, and thank you for the work you do with all of the people that we invite into NYU. Thank you to all of our partners across NYU. Uh, there's so many and so many who help us do this important work and there are just too many to name, but I do wanna say thank you. Let me also begin by saying, I hope that everyone is taking very good care. These are certainly challenging times and there is a lot to be concerned about and with, and of course, people to be concerned for. People keep saying that this is a new normal and I would like to suggest that it's not normal at all. The stress, the health disparities, caring for others in the home, being in our homes with our new colleagues, which sometimes are our pets, our spouses, et cetera, who sometimes are not the best colleagues. This is not normal. It is challenging. And so for all of us out there, I hope that we continue to take really good care. A lot has happened this year. We're in the midst of health and social crises, transformation, protests. A quick glance at the news will show that for many parts of this country and others, cases of COVID-19 are on the rise with continued disproportionate impact upon marginalized communities, particularly BIPOC communities members of our disability populations, and of course, the differential impact on women. I also wanna take a moment before we begin to just say again, that we are aware of the challenges taking place. And so we hope that as you engage with all of the things that I just mentioned, that you remember to take care of yourself. I used to travel about 70% of my time. And one of the things that they say, and I often say this to my team because they're so busy taking care of others, is remember to put your oxygen mask on first. We have to do that to care for others. And so many of us as members of marginalized communities spend so much of our time taking care of others. So let's remember that. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge all the people working in the front and those working behind the scenes. So all to all our medical professionals, assistants, et cetera, thank you. Thank you for sacrificing to keep all of us in health and our well-being. And then to all those people who are working behind the scenes, whose labor is often unseen and discounted. People who are cleaning up the hospitals, the grocery store workers, the people who are working in the plants and warehouses all across the globe. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing to support us and thank you and let us continue to show our gratitude. All of the essential workers out there, you're doing a tremendous job and we appreciate you. Again, please be safe and we hope that members of our NYU community and others, if you'd like to avail yourself of the resources, please take a, a look at our NYU COVID-19 information site. It's important that each of us across the NYU community and beyond recognize the urgency and scope of this impact. And of course, that we prioritize our well-being. Also, please avail yourself of the many resources, programs, et cetera, that we have done not only this semester, but in the past. If you're looking for additional resources and information, both about the pandemic, but also resources in terms of learning uh, about some of the things that I mentioned earlier in terms of differential impacts. Now I'd like to take a moment to honor those who've come before us, our ancestors, the lives that we have been lost historically and in the recent acts of violence. 
And of course, also to honor those indigenous peoples upon whose land we sit and occupy. Please join me in 10 seconds of silence. Thank you for that recognition. Again, thank you for joining us today in our final NYU Be Together Global Scholars and Innovators series. This conversation uh, lasts, we've had a number of conversations this semester. So thank you for tuning in and joining us. The Global Scholars and Innovators series, along with the rest of the NYU Be Together efforts, are centered, centered on innovating, acting, and transforming together. We hope that you'll follow us. For more updates, events, programs, and resources, especially as we close out this semester and we'll be getting next semester, we'll have lots more engagement opportunities to act, transform, and innovate. So now it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Tiari Jones for our final conversation today. I would be remiss if I didn't say this in the four. Uh, Tiari Jones and I have known each other for a little bit now. We'll talk a little, I, she'll tell the story about how we met, but I would just like to say uh, as a friend, author, scholar, rock star, we are super excited to have you here with us today. So thank you so much. Tiari Jones is a native of Atlanta. Jones is drawn to thorny coming of age stories set in the new South. In the tradition of writers from Flannery O'Connor to Jesmond Ward, she evokes her setting as vividly as her characters. Jones's first novel, Leaving Atlanta, and if you haven't read it, pick it up immediately, is a coming, a coming of age novel that echoes, a, excuse me, that echoes a few keynotes of the author's upbringing. Set against the backdrop of Atlanta, child murders of 1979 to 1981, it won the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for debut fiction. Her follow-up, The Untelling, won the Lillian Smith Award, Book Award in 2005. Jones brings us Aria, a survivor of family tragedy, who is keeping an intimate secret from her devoted boyfriend and best friend. And then, Tiari is also the author of Silver Sparrow. This novel is, quote, a tense, layered, and evocative tale, end quote, from that, and that's from the Minneapolis Star Tribune. It opens with the impossible to forget line, quote, my father, James Witherspoon, is a bigamist, end quote. And Old Fourth Ward, for North, uh, no, excuse me, North Fourth Coming will tell the story of a woman grappling with the idea of home, family, and identity. Jones is currently a Charles Howard Ch uh, Candler professor at Emory University and A.D. White professor at large at Cornell University. A member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers and Black Artists for Freedom has also earned a United States Art of Artist Fellowship, an NEA, National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Radcliffe Institute Bunting Fellowship, and a fellowship from the Black Mountain Institute at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, Time, Tin House, The Believer, among many others. And her story, Half Light, was a part of the first slate of short fiction audible originals. She is a very proud graduate of Spelman College. I guess I have a little envy there. The University of Iowa and Arizona State University. In her talks at campuses, libraries, and literary festivals across the country, Joan speaks on her many books, her life, career, and of course, the South, and in particular, Atlanta. An Oprah book club selection and also a pick by Obama, An American, Mar American Marriage was named a notable book by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and as I just said, included in Obama's best of 2018 roundup. In addition to being awarded the Women's Prize for Fiction, formerly known as the Orange Prize, the Aspen World's Prize, and NAACP for Outstanding Liter Literary Work in Fiction. It has been published in over 20 countries with over a million copies in print around the world. So 
very well established rock star author Tiari Jones. Thank you for bring, being with us here today. Thank you for joining me. And let's get started. Thank you for having me. I'm so delighted to join you. Great. Well, let's uh, let's dive right in. So, I want to talk first just a little bit about you and being a writer. So, not the books themselves, but the writing, the process, how you came to be a writer, and talk to us a little bit about those typewriters. Well, all my life, like many people who end up being writers, all my life I loved to write. I was writing little stories when I was a child, you know, and stapling them. And it was something that I did for my own pleasure. I was born in 1970, so I grew up with children's books with Black children in them. So I didn't have that moment some people have of, you know, suddenly realizing that Black people could be in books. But what I didn't know is that I could be a writer. I don't know where I thought books came from, but I didn't know that I as a person could be a novelist. And it wasn't until I was a student at Spelman College because I think before Spelman, my life as a young woman, really a girl, the question was always, is she a nice girl? So if you like to read and you like to write, people thought it was a sign of your niceness. If you made good grades, it's because you got your lesson. Not necessarily that you were an intellectual. Like I can't remember anyone saying, what are you thinking about what, you, what you're reading? What are you thinking about when you're writing? That was kind of beside the point. It was like, nice girl, you know, good girl, library, safe. But when I went to Spelman, that is when I met um, Dr. Janetta Cole. And I had told her that I wanted to be a writer. I don't know how I got that nerve. And it was at a reception. You know, she was shaking all of our little hands. And then I saw her a couple of weeks later and she said to me, you know, she has a big voice. She said, Tayari, how's the writing? And I was like, oh my goodness, I, I, I got to do this. I said it, she heard it. It was like, I said it, she signed off on it. And so it was. And then I met a writer for the first time and she was my teacher, it was Pearl Clegg. She was an adjunct professor at Spelman and she kind of took me under that wing. And one day she said to me, what are you thinking? And I said, um, well, I'm, I'm thinking about, and she says, don't speak, write it down. And with that, she became my first audience. All right, well, we've got Pearl on the stage. We have Janetta B. Cole on the stage. That's really, uh, and so, so let's talk now about, uh, uh, well, we're gonna talk about two books. We're gonna talk about Silver Sparrow and American Marriage mostly. So, uh, but again, if you haven't purchased Leaving Atlanta or The Untelling, please get those as well. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the writing of American Marriage. So tell us a little bit about when, where, how you were writing this, how you came to this story for those, of, those out there who haven't heard how you came to this story. And maybe in that story, you can always you can also mention that uh, for those of you out there, I promise that we'd have a little story about how we met. So I met Tiara Jones as she was writing uh, this book. And so um, so I had the opportunity to hear her speak. So let's talk a little bit about you coming to this book. And uh, if you have time, you can tell the story of how we met. OK. An American Marriage is my fourth novel. My first three novels really kind of mine the matters of my own autobiography. I was very kind of stubborn with that because I always felt that as a black writer, there was this incredible pressure that your writing should be about issues, almost like it should be racism, the musical, like, like you're gonna make, that's how you're gonna make your art. And, that, and I felt really frustrated because I felt like other people get to write coming of age stories about what it is to grow up or whatever's on their mind and no one tells them that's not a real story. That I wanted to write about being black is more than a problem. And so I just refused. I just wrote about my family and wrote about my feelings. And that was what I was doing, the end. Cause I'm hard headed like that. But then I also thought at the same time, if I'm letting people's expectations of my work keep me from a certain kind of subject matter I'm still being controlled by these expectations. Furthermore, depending on the time we have I have this incredible story of how my third novel almost didn't get published. Silver Sparrow almost didn't get published. And the way that it came to find a home, it was like a miracle, like a miracle, miracle. Maybe I'll tell it on the end, at the end. Oh, but I'm going to ask you about it. It's my next question. <laughs> <laughs> having been granted a miracle to have my career resuscitated, I had to say, okay, self, 
why do I think my, my career, my platform has been given back to me? And I decided that it was time for me to write about something that was larger than myself. And so I wanted to write a novel and I was interested in questions of incarceration, but I was less interested in the nuts and bolts of incarceration itself as to the way that the prevalence of incarceration has affected African-American culture. Like prison is in the water in African-American culture. But I didn't know how to get there. So I was doing all this research at Harvard on incarceration and I learned things that left me outraged, left me you know, despairing, left me just, you know, just ready to kick a door down or something. But I wasn't inspired because art for me comes from a place of inspiration. And if a novel is going to be any good, it's got to be about people and their problems, not problems and their people. And I just didn't know how to move forward. And so I went home to Atlanta to talk to my mentor, Pearl Clegg, about it. And, you know, she gave me some advice, but I still didn't know how to get into the book. And then I was in, in the shopping mall, you know, because a little, I have found a little shopping can take the edge off stress. Oh, and, while was, and while I was there, I went to the food court because I have also found French fries have been very therapeutic. For me. <laughs> I never met a French fry I didn't like. <laughs> Especially the waffle ones. But anyway, while I was down in the food court, I saw a couple and they were clearly in love and in trouble. The woman was fantastically dressed, shoes, hat, bag, you know, she just looked fantastic. And he looked okay, but she looked great. And this is why I noticed them. They seemed like the old people say, unevenly yoked. And I heard her say, clear as a bell. She said, Roy, you know, you wouldn't have waited on me for seven years. And I looked at her. I looked at him. They looked at me. And I felt that all three of us were in complete agreement that he would not have waited on her for nobody seven years. We all knew it. There was no question. But then he turned to her, he kind of pushed back from the table a little bit. He said, I don't know what you're talking about because this wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. And again, we were in agreement. And that's when I knew, that's what I need for a novel. For me, novels dwell in a place of moral ambiguity. So when I was trying to write about a man who had been wrongfully incarcerated, there was no moral ambiguity. They call it wrongful incarceration because it's wrong. There's nothing else to say. But when I started thinking about a young couple, almost newlyweds, and the husband has been arrested for a crime he has not committed, what will happen to their relationship? What is it reasonable to ask of her? How do they move forth as a family? Will they move forth as a couple? Are there other ways forward? What about this whole ride or die thing, suggesting that you know Black women's contribution is to wait, to be chased? Like, is our chastity really going to open the prisons? So these are the questions I was asking myself. And that's that's where the novel came from. You, in an interview, in a, a discussion with James Hanahan at the Brooklyn Public Library, you said you thought about becoming a doula to usher in human babies rather than the labor of love of birthing literary lives. So let's talk about that miracle. Let's talk about the miracle of Silver Sparrow and actually getting it, right? Ushering it in. So speak to us about those moments when you'd have, when you've had to face difficulty, right? And some of the challenges, and then talk to us about miracles. Okay, here's the thing. Writing books are not like having babies because <laughs> the thing about the difference between one of the main, well, one, books don't have to be fed and they don't have to go to college. But the thing about books is that the hard part of the book is before it's born. And babies are the opposite. So I was um, writing, I had written two novels, Leaving Atlanta and The Untelling. I felt proud of them. I mean, I knew they weren't bestsellers. Obviously I knew I wasn't rich. One notices that one is not rich, but I was happy. I felt like I was doing what I loved. And I was really surprised when my publisher said that they didn't want to publish me anymore because I wasn't making enough money for them. I was like, wait, we're supposed to be making money? Nobody told me we're supposed to be making money. I thought we were supposed to be making art. And they were just like, uh-huh, no. And so no one would publish me because they put my name in the computer and the computer said I wasn't profitable. So I had written about 150 pages of Silver Sparrow, which I thought as a third book would be enough to just let my publisher know I'm on the right track and I could you know, get signed up, but nobody would touch me. And so here I am with half a book. And I decided that I had to finish the book. You know why? Because I teach. And I tell my students that you write the story you're called to write. I don't like to talk to my students about the business, about agents, editors, because I want them to write from their heart, not write to the market. 
So if I'm telling them that they have to write from their hearts, how can I abandon my half completed novel because the market doesn't want me? So I wrote it, I finished it. It took me a long time because I was really, really depressed and I felt hopeless. And I wrote it fully believing that it would have an audience of one, which is my sister for whom I had written the book. Yes. I finished the book, took me about a year, year, another year and a half. I printed a copy for myself, I printed a copy for her and that was it. I had one speaking engagement remaining on my calendar and I was embarrassed to even go because I thought everyone would know that I didn't have a career anymore. But at the same time, you know, when you're black, you feel like, okay, I'm the only black person there. I don't want them to say, we tried to integrate, we tried diversity, but she didn't show up. So, you know, I didn't want to ruin it for everybody behind me. So I decided that I would go. And to make matters worse, my books were out of print. But I went to the thing and I gave my little reading. I was the saddest little person you ever saw. And after I read, gave the reading, a woman said to me, she wanted to buy a book. I didn't have any books because I was out of print and I was so embarrassed. And she said, I think I can help you. And, you know, people say things, you meet weird people on the road. One day I'll tell you about that time I got kidnapped in Martha's Vineyard. But anyway, she, this lady, she took me by the hand and she carried me through the crowd and she placed my hand in the hand of a publisher literally. And I knew the publisher because I had admired her. And also she had already rejected me because I think she put my name in the computer. Anyway, the woman talked to me and I was just trying to get away because I was so embarrassed. But she says, before you go, you didn't tell me, how do you know Judy? And I said, oh, I don't know anyone named Judy. And she says, no, no, no. I mean, Judy Bloom, who just introduced us. And it was as though my nerdy childhood had come to rescue me in my time of need. And it was a really a miracle. I am not the person things like that happen to. I have always been the one who felt like I had to work twice as hard, work, 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 and you may or may not get acknowledged. And here out of nowhere, you know, my favorite author from childhood got my career back on track. And, and then I was writing it and my students, they love to say, you see professor, that just shows it's not who, what you know is who you know. But I tell them, no, the moral of this story is do your work because I had completed my work so that when Judy Bloom opened the door, I was able to walk through. That's excellent. Thank you so much. So let's talk about the books. All right. So you already mentioned uh, Silver Sparrow. You start that book in the opening and dedicated to your to your sister. And then um, in An American Marriage, uh, also when you open up the dedication to American Marriage, you dedicate it to your mother's sister. So we see the sister theme here and to Alma Man for Maxine and Marsha and my own. So let's talk a little bit about these books. And you know, one of the things that I think, and certainly this came up even in my introduction, is you have a way of opening books, right? I mean, uh, the bigamist line. And then if we uh, open an American marriage, I'm just going to read quickly from here. Uh, I love this line. So there are two kinds of people in the world, those who leave home and those who don't. I'm a proud member of the first category. And then it goes on, my wife Celestial used to say that I'm a country boy at the core, blah, 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 blah. So let's talk about these openings. How do you decide on how you're gonna open, how you're going to uh, bring us in? Actually, the, begin the first page of any book is the last thing I write because the beginning of a book is the introduction. But when I'm starting the book, I don't know the book. So I can't introduce you to a story I don't know yet. So once I finish the whole book, I say to myself, what is this really about? What is this really, really about? And an American marriage is a story about being at home and whether or not you can escape your roots or whether or not you should escape your roots. Even though it is in fact a novel about wrongful imprisonment and that is kind of, wrongful imprisonment is kind of, it's like a flashing light and it takes a lot of attention in the story, but that's the problem. Wrongful imprisonment is a problem it's not a story. So the, the sto every book is really about what is the person's heart issue. And Roy's heart issue is his desire to escape his country town and live this kind of fancy Atlanta life. And when he goes to prison, he feels like his, you know, his working class small town upbringing came and snatched him back from his Atlanta life. 
So, and I, this, uh, it's interesting the way you frame that, because I think I'll just talk about, say this about leaving Atlanta as well, which I also talked about the, in, the, in the introduction, right? The backdrop of incarceration, of the child murders, right? So the situatedness of it, but the fact that you're not actually, you're focusing on the relationships. So let's talk a little bit about these relationships. The first, I wanna talk a little bit, and you brought this up earlier, and you talked about this concept of a nice girl. So let's talk about Celestial. Is Celestial a nice girl? Does she follow the rules? How might a nice girl, and there are a number of ways in which throughout the, um, the text, right, she seems to do things that may be a little different than, um, than the expectations of her. So let's talk a little bit about what it means to be a nice girl, what you're doing with the character of Celestial, what you're disrupting or not. And, um, and then tell us a little bit about the feedback that you've gotten on these characters. Okay, the basic story of an American marriage is that Celestial and Roy are only a year married when he is arrested for a crime he hasn't committed. She is ambitious, she is a, an artist, she's on the way up. And before her husband is in prison, he loves the fact that she's an artist and she's successful. And, but once he becomes imprisoned, the expectations of her become very narrow. I always say when the going gets tough, people get really conservative. It's almost as though feminism or women having independent lives and, and narrative independence is a luxury. And that when her husband is in prison, particularly because Roy's, Roy's imprisonment is racist. So he is a victim of the racist state. And, and therefore it's kind of in the black community, it's all hands on deck. There's a black man who's a victim of the racist state, which is a real thing, but what does it mean for what are her expectations of her life. And the idea that she should be chased and wait on him, ride or die, like that's the whole thing that he is in prison. And almost like as a gesture, she should um, almost like throw herself on his fire because, because he is in prison, she should be imprisoned in a way. Um, one of the questions I like to ask is, is it more selfish to for her to want her own life or is it more selfish, selfish for him not to want her to have her own life? And this is a question that I didn't know the answer to because it was so against everything culturally I've ever been taught. So when I would tell people when I was working on it, I'm writing a novel about a woman whose husband is wrongfully in prison. Everyone was expecting one woman's brave fight to free her man. Right? Like kind of like if Beale Street could talk, just one woman's endless capacity for suffering, that this idea that what women's place in the movement is to mourn. And I was just really kind of thinking about the way people live in real life, because actually in real life, people are way more ride or die in books, movies, records than in real life. In real life, people really struggle with, with this question of how much do I of my life do I devote to, the, to, my, to my partner? Whether your partner is in jail or not, that's, that's a general question. And when your partner's in jail, it's like someone turned the heat up. You know, they turn, they, they turn the volume up to 11 on a machine that only goes to eight. So let's talk about marriage. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about marriage. So you could, because you write about marriage in both of these books, Silver Sparrow and An American Marriage. So, uh, and, 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 and I know, I mean, uh, probably people out there in terms of the title of the book, An American Marriage, we should probably come back to that in terms of thinking about that as a title. So uh, in, if you want to gesture toward that, but I'll come back to it. But let's talk about this idea of marriage. And in both of these texts, right, marriage, to go back to what you were just saying, is extremely complicated. The ways in which it's nuanced, um, and the ways in which people understand marriage, right? So to go back to what you said about expectations, et cetera. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing with this concept of marriage and sort of bouncing it around a little bit. And I have to say, they're not like the marriages, and this goes back to something I also think you said, um, these marriages remind me of marriages I've seen, as opposed to the story of marriage, which is often a happy-go-lucky story. Not that I, to say I haven't seen happy marriages too, but I'm just saying like, I think there's something real about the ways in which you're complicating some things. So let me shut up and let you talk a little bit. <laughs> 
So one of the things when I write, I like to write characters that feel like they live in the world, not characters that feel like they live in a book. It's a really different thing. Um, Roy and Celestial, also I didn't want them to be like a perfect couple torn apart by his incarceration because do you ever watch Dateline? I watched Dateline. Yes. You know, Dateline, it's always like they had everything. She was beautiful. He was handsome. They had money. And then <laughs> disaster struck. It's almost like Dateline wants to make, it's like Dateline believes that tragedy isn't a tragedy if the people weren't perfect. It's a kind of respectability. It's really a kind of respectability politics where they earn our sympathy by being perfect. But one, that's not helpful to any real life people who are reading the book because they won't see themselves in the work. And it's just not inter it's just not interesting. And for me, it takes me five years to write a book. I need to be interested. So Celestial and Roy, they're a regular couple. They got some problems like, you know, he's a little bit of a cheater. I mean, nothing to write home about, but he's a little bit of a cheater. And they have all this class conflict because he's from a small town and her family has a lot of money and they're trying to figure out, like, for example, they don't pay rent because they live in a house her parents gave them. And he's trying to decide is he a kept man or a lucky man or both or how or what. So there's their problems are like lots of people's problems. And then this disaster strikes, but there are lots of marriages in the book. Like his parents have a marriage, her parents have a marriage. We know her parents have a complicated backstory to their marriage. What's funny to me is that all the adults, well, the older adults, the earlier generation, her, their parents, they all are on their second marriages, at least. They are all on their second relationships, yet they want to be the marriage police. They, those old people are the marriage police. And when you say, well, daddy, you did this or that when you were young, he's like, that was different. That was different. But I feel that marriage is something people are into as a concept more than the way that it's actually played out. And, it, and marriage on some level is a performance. It is a, to be married is a public performance of your relationship. To wear the ring is a public declaration of your relationship. The ring itself is a language. It says something about you. I mean, it's marriage is not, even though Celestial's father says marriage is between two people, there is no studio audience. Marriage is between a bunch of people. And it's about trying to manage those, the community part of marriage with the personal part of marriage, figure out what is responsibility yet what is pride? It's just a lot of questions. And what is it reasonable to ask of another person? And in Silver Sparrow, we have a lot of marriage. We have someone who's married to more than one person as we, as I quoted before in terms of bigamy. So, uh, so I do think, right, that uh, it's interesting how you're complicating this, this notion of, uh, of marriage. And I, I, have to, I have to leave little tidbits for the readers in case you haven't read American Marriage. There's also an opening line about, uh, about a, a knife. And what I love is this line that you say, the trust in the blade, right? That it's the purchase of the blade that demonstrates trust in the marriage. Uh, so just, I'm saying really, really, really interesting and um, complicated. And, uh, and again, this idea of children and out, the outside child in Silver Sparrow also. So this leads me to my next question, which is really about uh, uh, this, um, this setting. So when you set your text from leaving Atlanta to Silver Sparrow to this one, if they're set in Atlanta. And there are, for those of you who haven't read the text, very careful references. Things that if you don't know, I mean, everything from Spellhouse to Piedmont to Buck, Buckhead to Aspie to the Marta, right? To all these things that are very specific to an Atlanta context. So tell us about, and you you opened by saying so, uh, about writing about sort of like biography and, and, and sort of integrating that in. So tell us a little bit about that and also the setting of Atlanta and why to some degree you, right, you stuck with it. Right, some people might move to another location or something. So tell us about Atlanta and tell us about those references. Well, most writers have something that the, it's the thing they do. They don't bounce around a lot. Like, you know, you don't expect to see a Toni Morrison novel set in Miami. You just don't. Yeah. Ohio. Yeah, she's not, she's not gonna write about Miami. It's not her thing. Um, Atlanta is my thing. It's my place, it's my hometown. Also, I'm a big person for regional writing. I'm trying to bring, bring regional writing back. I'm not interested in writing about any town USA because there's no such place as any town USA. That's usually a, a very homogenizing racist idea of what constitutes middle America or basic America. 
So I write about my natural habitat. I wrote my first book about growing up in Atlanta during the Atlanta child murders, because that's what I grew up. That's what I know from when I was a child. Um, I was not aware, having spent my entire young life in Atlanta, how completely people misunderstand the South. But like when I moved to New York, I moved and I was living in Brooklyn, and I'd tell people I was from Georgia, they would act like I had got up there on the Underground Railroad. They were like, really? You know, like, like I had somehow, you know, escaped to um, Park Slope. <laughs> and then I got really kind of defensive, kind of defensive writing about my hometown because I was like trying to represent for my hometown. But I find Atlanta to be extremely interesting, particularly because it has a critical mass of black people in Atlanta. And therefore you can really get into the granular details of black life. You can look at the class distinctions within Atlanta and, and the way that black people speak to, speak to each other. And, you know, like how black people think about things other than white people. And I think that that Atlanta may, really makes it perfect because when I grew up in Atlanta, I did not, I didn't grow up around any, I grew up in a middle-class area of Atlanta and I did not, I never had a white teacher. No, we had a white teacher. What was that lady's name? But I hardly had any white teachers. I have one white teacher whose name I cannot remember because it wasn't a thing for me. I had a black dentist, a black doctor. You know how people tell you that the earth is 80% water? and you don't believe it because you're sitting here on solid ground. That's how I felt about being a minority. I had heard that America was like 80% white. I had heard this. And I think on some level, I believed it, like I believe it about the water. But there was a part of me that was like, if America is 80% white, where are they? <laughs> I never felt like a minority. However, in 1992, I moved to Iowa. It's true. <laughs> Yes, Iowa and Atlanta, and especially where the University of Iowa is located, there's very different, very different locations. So this, sorry. This also brings me to my next question. So because the other thing that you do in these references is that I'm just going to name some of the things that you mentioned. Okay. Jerry Curl, for those of you who don't know what a Jerry Curl is, I remember uh, with the J. Uh, the United Negro College Fund, The Cosby Show, Beauty Parlors. Prince has dropped in there a few times. Prince the Singer, Purple Rain, a number of Prince references. We should probably ask a question about the Prince things. Mahogany and Diana Ross. You know, and if you haven't seen Billy D. Williams and Diana Ross between Lady Sings the Blues and Mahogany, uh, and it just goes on. The Wiz, I mean, it's just reference after reference. So, my next question is about this situatedness and blackness. But before we get there, I want to talk, go back to this question about the title of an American marriage, right? So tell us about how you got to the title, an American marriage. And then I'm going to follow up again by talking about this situated, this situated blackness. Do we have to go in that order? Okay, no, we can, what, what order would you like to go in? Is I want your, to talk oh. about this. I want to talk about the references first. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and. Every, I feel like this, I feel like everybody makes references in their books. I think like when you're a black writer, there's a lot of concern. People always are like, I don't know if everyone's gonna know what this is. You know, like if, if, if you're making your work less universal by making it more specific. But I do think one thing for me that's important is that all my life I read things that were not geared to me and it wasn't a big deal. Like it just wasn't. I mean, like I, like I think about when I was in high school, I used to read Stephen King a lot. And it never occurred to me that I should not be terrified because it's set in Maine and has lots of Maine references. Therefore, it doesn't have anything to do with me, right? <laughs> when I read Stephen King, there's like a really vicious clown and it lives in the, in the sewer and it's eating people. It never occurred to me to be like, but yes, yeah, that's Maine and it's cold and I live in Atlanta and I'm black. Because as a black reader, I never had this feeling that I had to be looking in the mirror to appreciate anything. And so I think that all readers have that potential. And I like to use Stephen King as an example, because when you're black and you write something and other people can quote unquote relate to it, people try to make it seem like, oh, you're a genius. You have somehow made blackness legible to others. But I think that everything is legible to others if others are just even slightly open to things. Like, you don't, all, all stories are universal, but it's that the racism makes people assume the story won't be like, sometimes someone will say to me, 
you know, I was, I'm a white man and I was reluctant to read this book, but then it occurred to me that when I was a child, I read science fiction and I'm not an alien. And I was like, are you telling me in your mind being black is the same as being a Martian? <laughs> and he's a nice person who read my book, but, and he wasn't even embarrassed about saying that to me because he felt that I should understand that I am a Martian to him. And then he was like, but you're not, it's amazing. So that is something that I don't, I don't change my writing because I don't think it needs to be changed. I don't think I, I don't change the writing and I don't feel like you just have to figure it out. I feel like you're, you're literate. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Now for the title and American marriage, it was not my first idea to title this book, this, I wanted to call it a bunch of other things, but I've never been great at titles. And I, my editor and I were brainstorming and I just said, oh, let's call it an American marriage. I was being cute. I was like, we'll call it that because people love to hear about things that are American. I even said that my cat, Canella, I said, Canella is writing a memoir. It's called An American Feline. And it's going to be the definitive book about being a house cat in Brooklyn. And my editor was like, I like it. I was like, I'm not writing a cat book. And he said, no, I like an American marriage. And I said, no, no, no. He said, yes, yes, yes. This went on for some time. I came up with other titles. He said, no, no, no. I came up with more titles. And finally, I went back to Atlanta again to talk to Pearl. And I told her that I felt like the title and American marriage made it sound like it wasn't black anymore. Like it wasn't about me that they were trying. I said, are they trying to, what is, what is up? Are they trying to disguise the book? Like, what are they doing? You know how they do on the book covers. They don't let anybody know you're black. Is that what's happening? And she said, maybe, maybe not because this story is very American. America incarcerates more of its citizens than any other country. So what happens to Celestial and Roy is so American. She said, but also this is an American marriage because this is an American novel. It's an American novel because you're an American novelist. You are an American novelist because you are an American citizen. And I told her that, I, yeah, kind of, that, you know, never in my life have I been called American without another word in front of it. I've been called Black American. I've been called African American. No matter where I am in the world, no one ever called me American. And she said they don't, but they should because you are. And a lot of people sacrifice a lot for you to claim that citizenship if you want to. She said, so if you don't like the title, she said, you don't have to like that title. Let's say you don't like the way it looks on the page. You don't like how it sounds to the ear whatever, that's your business. But she said, do not reject this title because you don't think you have a right to it. And I thought about it. I went back and forth. And finally I said to my editor, well, can we call it story of American marriage, portrait of an American marriage an American tapestry? I had all these words. And he said, why are you trying to make your idea smaller? You don't want it to sound like a big book. And he said, have more faith in yourself and your work. And that was nothing but gender. There was nothing but gender. As a woman, I'm trying to say, I'm not doing, just writing my little book. I'm not trying to. And so I finally told him, okay, let's call it an American marriage. And he said, thank God, because we have already designed the cover. <laughs> so there you go. True story. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. So let's now talk a little bit about, um, you know, and so I'm going to go now, I know I'm jumping back and forth between American Marriage and Silver Sparrow. So talk to us a little bit about how you came to write the story Silver Sparrow. We talked quite a bit about how you came to write the story in American Marriage. But tell us a little bit about Silver Sparrow and what, how you came to that story, how you're trying to think about, and for those people who don't know the story, perhaps give them that brief synopsis like you did with, uh, with American Marriage. An American and buy the book. <laughs> Read the book. You can read the book and buy it. You have to buy the book. You can also get it from library. It's a pandemic. People in school. <laughs> okay. So we, we, we're going to have some copies of the book too. So, you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, Silver Sparrow is the story of the first line of it is my father, James Witherspoon, is a bigamist. He was already 10 years married when he first clapped eyes on my mother. In, 1970, in 1966, she was working at the gift wrap counter at Davis's downtown when my father asked her to wrap the carving knife he had bought his wife for their wedding anniversary. That's the lady I was mentioning earlier. <laughs> mother says that she knew something wasn't right between a man and a woman when the gift was a blade. Yeah, that's about all I have for my memory. I think that's all I got from my- You I, go on I, to say that the blade is a sign of trust <laughs> between the two. 
I said, maybe that means there was some kind of trust between them. I love my mother, but we tend to see things a little bit differently. The point is that James's marriage was never hidden from us. James is what I call him. His other daughter, Charisse, the one who lives in the house with him, she calls him daddy even now. That's all I got. So that's what uh, Silver Sparrow is about. It's about the secret child. She was born because I wanted to, I was interested in this idea of what we call half siblings. I have two sisters and we have a different, we have different, different mothers, same father. And we grew up completely separately, but they're my sisters, but I didn't really know them when I was growing up. It was like, I both had a sister and didn't have a sister. It's like, I had a sister that lived in my peripheral vision. And when I would turn my head, there's no one there. And my daddy is not a bigamist, you know, that I know of, which is all any of us can say. But I knew of my sisters, I just didn't know them. And so many people have this situation where they have siblings, where you have a parent in common, but you don't have a life in common. And it's, and it's something that isn't really spoken about. We talk about blended families, but what about the families that haven't blended? So I wrote this book as a gift to my sister. I wanted her to know that I've been thinking about her every day of my life. Thank you. So let's, um, let's now talk a little bit about this concept of home, because I also think similar to this concept of marriage, and then I'm gonna ask you another question about something else you discussed, but this concept of home and what makes a home, how home is defined and made. And I'm particularly thinking of Silver Sparrow here, um, American Marriage too, but in Silver Sparrow, we have two different homes, right? And where people are existing, trying to live their life. So tell us a little bit about how you in your novels has explored this concept of home, right? And the complications therein. You know, I think, I think more, it's more for me like a question of family, Mm -hmm. Which home and family are almost the same thing, but this idea of their, that, you know, you're tied to your family, but you also have the family you choose, but you can never really cut loose the family you were born with. And we also have so many fantasies about, especially, oh my goodness, this time of year, so many fantasies about how we want to feel. Like every time you see a commercial and they're just like home, you know, it's nothing more important than family. It's nothing better than being home. I'm thinking 80% of people watching this commercial, it makes them feel slightly inadequate. But I was also interested in, like in Silver Sparrow, here's the subtext of Silver, Silver Sparrow and family and home. It's that so many women before 19, I was born in 1970, the birth control pill came to wide usage in 1972, 73. Mm -hmm. Before then, women really didn't have control over their um, reproduction. They couldn't control their fertility. So, uh, so many families were forced into existence because someone got pregnant and they had to just make a family. And that's the thing about James. James is a bigamist. He has two wives and his first wife, he, they got married when they were like in the ninth grade because she was pregnant. But here's the thing. And so we think about that she was forced to get married because she was pregnant, but he too was forced into a child marriage. So he's with the person he's been with since like the 10th grade. And then when he's an adult, he meets this other woman and he's just so taken by her because he's been married since he was in the 10th grade and then she gets pregnant. And so then he feels like he has to marry her too. So now he's forced into this bigamous situation all because it's like babies happen to people. And it's hard for us to get our heads around that now because birth control Contraception is just a part of life. So it's hard for us to understand, like my grandmother had 12 children, she only wanted two. Think of, I mean, not to overshare, but just imagine how many kids so many of us would have if, you know, if it was just- Yeah, I mean, right, I mean. <laughs> so and think of how many of us would never be born. But this is how one of the things, so people, people made family because of and in spite of biology. Biology used to be a, it was a much bigger hurdle, I think, than it is now. And you also bring up the important gender, right, issues in relation to who's caring for family, who's caring for home, how that gets played out. And you explore some of that in your text. Well, also in Silver Sparrow, you know, the, the, the kids are unsupervised because their mothers work as domestic servants. So the mothers are, you know, the kind of domestic servants that stay at the rich people's house. So every time a woman is, not every time, but frequently when a woman is a live-in maid, she, got, she has kids. If you think about books like The Help, don't get me started, 
the woman, the, the, the maid that's like part of the family, there's never any mention of the fact that she has a family. She don't need to be in your family. She has a family. And that family is being neglected because she's performing this role for this other family. So, so she's being kind of like paid to be part of these other people's family when her heart is at home with her own family. And this is how all, so many plot, part of the plot of, an, of Silver Sparrow happened because of the, the black women being taken out of their homes. Thank you. So uh, my next question, and I just have to turn to a couple of, I'm gonna switch back to an American marriage just to let you know. And so my next question is really is about love. And you write a, you write a lot about love. You have a lot of, uh, <clears throat> So this is, uh, maybe this is actually, I think actually this one is from um, Silver Sparrow. Actually, this is love can be incremental. Then you write in American Marriage, and this is on page, I think this is on page 135. Did I get there? Yeah. Black love is black wealth. When I, and you're, um, and you have this, it's when I was 24 living in New York City, I thought that maybe black love went that way too integrated into near extinction. Nikki Giovanni said, quote, black love is black wealth, end quote. And then you go on to on page 289. Let me just get there really quickly. I think that's the right page. Yes. Uh, Yes, and then you talk about how love changes, the, the changing nature of love, and uh, it's, it's celestial, and it says, she said that love can change its shape, but for me at least, this is a lie. I kept my arms around her, my body aching and cramped, but I held her until muscles failed because when I let her go, she would be gone. So talk to us about love. You know, I made a um, um, playlist when you publish a book these days, things have changed since like the days of Morrison. When you publish a book now, you have all this stuff you have to do. Like they want you to make a playlist. They want you to make a menu. Like it's, it's a lot, a book club menu, all these things. So one of the things that I did was I made a playlist for an American marriage. I think it is on um, the website, Large Hearted Boy. Anyway, what I did for this playlist was I started it with Prince reference with Adore by Prince. There, there's, there, there are two people right now who they need to know, what, do you love Prince? What's going on with Prince? You got to integrate that into the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I chose Adore by Prince for that because to, that song was very popular when I was like in the in the 12th grade, but you know, like he's saying how, you know, he's gonna stay on the phone till the sun comes up and you know, he loves her more than anything except his car, like all this kind of really childish, passionate, stay up all night kind of love. And I think that's what Celestial and Roy have when they're first started. You know, they have that kind of Frida Diego um, throwing pottery kind of love. You know, like that just kind of thing, like I can't live without you, I love you, I hate you. You know, like that kind of childish, but intense kind of love. And then at the end of the playlist, I ended it with Ass by Stevie Wonder, you know, which is like likening the love to the changing of the seasons, you know, like, and that's what I think the journey for the lovers in the story is that, you know, this is about people trying to be in one another's lives in a healthy way. And that it may not look like, this is not about like, do you love me? Check yes, check no, because it's never that simple and nor do you want it to be. This is about figuring out how people in romantic love and family love and all kinds of love, how love is just that love is your wealth. And it's love is how, how you care for one another. It's not who's faithful, who's unfaithful, like none of that. They, get, they have to get past that. So what the, the weird thing that they learn from the tragedy of this incarceration is they learn different things about the ways that people are connected. And so let's talk about, because because you, you mentioned this in your answer to home and then obviously here, right, family. And I, you know, I, I left the family question toward the end because I've asked you questions about marriage and love and home and all of those things. And obviously these characters that you're creating but in all of your texts, one of the things that I think you interrogate the most, right, in some ways, is this idea of family, how we make family, how we maintain family, how we interrogate family. 
So talk to us a little bit about how you came to sort of thinking about this idea of family and then the unpacking of it in some ways, because that's what I see you doing often, right? It's sort of taking this, whether it's chosen or biological or whatever, and then unpacking the, taking us into that granularity of what it means to be in a family, both <laughs> good and bad. So talk to us well, a little I mean, bit about the that. The thing about chosen family, which, provides just such fruitful place to write about. And also that's another thing about marriage because it's chosen family yeah. is that chosen family, you actually can opt out. You can opt out of chosen family. So um, when you, so when the characters work best, when they are opting in, when they're opting in or out. So you get the, the decision-making that the characters make for one thing. And also, I think we all want to deeply want to figure out how to fine tune our families, the families we're in, whether they're our chosen family or our born family. We want to make families or small communities that sustain us. We all want, we all want, everyone's interested in that and everyone's interested in making it better. And we all have grievances. I got grievances. We all got grievances. And we, and I think we deeply want desire to get past our grievances also. And so I always want characters to work something out. My characters may not have the happy ending, like spoiler alert, Celestial and Roy don't live happily ever after, but I think they live positively forward. And that's what I'm always trying to find is the way forward in our relationships. Because if we can find a way forward in our relationships, then we can find the ways forward in our community. We can find the ways forward in our community. We can find the ways forward as a nation. If we can find the way forward as a nation, the world, you get the idea. Yeah, like getting it together starts at home. Thank you. Please, uh, please submit your questions in the q and I'm going to turn to some of the q and I already asked, uh, wanted, uh, got the Prince sort of references in there because uh, we have some Prince fans out there. We hosted a Prince conference here at NYU uh, uh, last spring. So, um, so thank you to those, the people who did that as well. So um, this is, I think, a really, it piggybacks on a question that I was going to ask you, but it goes back to you talking about Janetta B. Cole and Pearl Cleage and particularly how they provided sort of right mentorship in a kind of way. So one of the questions out there, and I'm sure there, it's a larger question for a number of people. Now you're a mentor in some ways, right? You're a teacher. You've talked about the students that you teach. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, she's also on the 100 uh, most uh, important books uh, on one of, uh, including people like Zora Neale Hurston, et cetera. And so tell us a little bit about that turn for you, right? And how you have thought about what it means to be a mentor and what advice would you give young black women when Janetta B. Cole asked you about your writing or when you went to see Pearl, right? And they helped you move along your way. So I know that in your teaching, et cetera, you do a lot of that, but tell us a little bit about what that looks like and what advice you might have for some of the, for some of the young people out there who are burgeoning writers. You know, I think the most important thing is to write the story that you want to write, find out as little as possible about the business of writing. No one has ever said, wow, I just got back from a lecture about the writing business and I feel so inspired. <laughs> Never have that happen. It doesn't, the business does not inspire. Also, the business is always changing. So by the time you learn about it, by the time you try to follow that instruction, the business has moved on and changed anyway. And you want to write the book you want to write. Like you want to find a publisher who will publish what you write. You don't want to write what they will publish. It's kind of like love, you know, like you can't find, you can't find love trying to find out what people like and be that thing because you won't find someone who loves what you are. So you just write your story and you just practice a lot. Like I write, I had to write so much to finally write my first book. I wrote a book um, when I was about 23, 24. It was a dog of a novel. It was just horrible, but I finished it. I wrote it, it was, I, had bought, I bought a piece of equipment. Um, it was new. It was supposed to help you write. It was called a laptop computer because you could hold it on your lap. I was like, that's amazing. You could hold it on your lap. And it was advertised, it only weighed 11 pounds. I was like, 11 pounds, get out. I could carry that around. And they came with a special backpack and I was like carrying it all around so that I could write anywhere. And making that investment, cause it costs like $900, but it was no payments, no interest if you paid it off in a certain amount of time. But making that investment, having to get my credit check to get it, 
I was like, I am serious about this. I spent money on it. It's like, I, I, I locked it in. And so I had a job where I didn't have my own desk and there was a ladies lounge. It was like a really a bathroom with a little couch in there. And I would go in, there was the only private place I had at work and I would go in the ladies lounge and I would be working on my little book. And it was a dog. I tell you, it was terrible. I revisited it, it's even worse than I remembered. But when I finished it, I said, I finished this book. It sucks, but it's complete. I said, if I can write this book, I can write another book and it'll be a little better. And if I have to, I'll write another book and it'll be a little better. I'm going to get better. But now I know I can write a book. And that's how you have to do it. And you have to be a person who is able to work for a long time, you know, without, without a follow, without a mention, like you got to sit there and work on this book for years. And no one knows, like when I was working on an American marriage, Nobody knew I was, nobody, I wasn't getting any positive affirmation. Nobody was listening to me. No one was, you know, I heard, I saw someone on the internet say, whatever happened to Tiari Jones? Like I had died, but you got to just do your own work and find the pleasure in your own work. And then there'll be this flurry of attention for a couple of years. And then you go away and you do your, you're like a cicada. You just like under the ground. Then every seven years you come out and everyone's like, oh, the cicadas are back. And then you go back down. That's how you have to do it. You got to be satisfied within yourself and keep doing your work. Don't worry that you're not rich. And so you can't write every day. I don't write every day. I got other things to do, but the other things I have to do make my writing richer. So the things like taking, I take care of my elderly parents, taking care of your parents, taking care of your kids, working, whatever you do, that's, it's not, what is it? What's the expression? It's not a bug. It's a feature that will make your writing better. I don't want to read a book by someone who doesn't do anything all day, but sit around and write. What are they going to write about? So your life is your superpower. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So some people still have questions about your writing process. We talked a little bit about that in the beginning, but I want to go back because for people who don't know about your typewriters, tell us about your typewriters. We can see them in the background. So you've got to talk about them a little bit. I see the red one, I see the black one, I see three or four of them. I can't see the top shelf there, but so talk to us about these typewriters. I love my typewriters. Um, this red one, she's, she's a Valentine. Um, she's very light. She weighs about 11 pounds. She weighs about as much as that um, laptop. But this is an Olivetti Valentine. I like manual typewriters. Um, one, I just love them as equipment, but also it's very satisfying to use them. You make all that noise. You feel like you're getting something done. Also, you may notice there are no plugs. It is not connected to the internet. So because it's not connected to the internet, there's nothing beeping in. I'm totally in, in, immersed in the work and it's hard to delete. When I'm typing on a computer, I, I was writing something on a computer yesterday. I, I never do that. And I got, I had like a fit of uncertainty and I pressed a couple of keys and I deleted the whole page. And on the typewriter, if you get mad, I can pull it out the machine, ball it up, throw it away. But then I come to my senses, I pick it up, I smooth it out, still have it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so my next question, uh, and so we got a couple birthday wishes out there for those of you who don't know, she just had a birthday. So happy belated birthday or happy birthday again. I wished you on the day, but belated birthday from some of the participants. Um, so let's talk, uh, the next question I want is, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance, uh, go back to something that you talked about regional writers and, um, and to get beyond the any town USA writing. So, right, to, to, for that kind of specificity. So talk to us a little bit about your interest there why, and the significance of that. Well, the reason I moved back home to Atlanta um, was for the, because I was realized I was becoming like a Southern writer in exile. I lived in Brooklyn and I realized that most, not most, but many of America's most prominent writers we lived within walking distance of one another. Like I could go into the annex um, coffee shop and I could see anybody. And at first it was kind of a thrill to be like, oh my goodness, you know, the whole of American literary tradition is right here having a muffin. <laughs> but here's a problem with that. Even though we may have come from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, if we're all in the same coffee shop eating the same muffin, there is going to become a sameness about our work because we're consuming the same world. 
And so, and I mean, I know when I went to New York, a big part of it was, you know, you got to be where the action is, but I decided it wasn't that it wasn't good for me. I needed to come back home. I noticed that my characters were spending more and more time indoors. In my first book, they're outside all the time. This time they're more, because I was losing my footing with the landscape of Atlanta. And I just, I wanted to come home and write from here. This country, America is huge compared to other countries. And the writing needs to reflect that breadth and I really want to try and like get more, hear from more writers writing from Nebraska, like people who are not on the coast telling the specific stories. Tell me the specific story of your hometown. Like in American Marriage, Roy is from a very specific town in Louisiana where among other things, one of the, part of the cuisine is hot tamales, um, which is a Louisiana food. People, it's, it's, a, it's a Mexican food that came to Louisiana and Louisiana has its own spin on hot tamales. And that's in the book because that is culture. Food is culture, all these things. And we're losing it because we're so encouraged to make our work quote unquote universal. And the novel is the place where we can talk about the little details of life that will never make it into a history book. Like no one in history is going to ask where 15 year old girls shoplift lipstick from in the 1980s, but it's in the novel. So we have a question about incarceration. Okay. So a little bit, uh, talk to us a little bit about incarceration and, you know, we, not the, not the, not the whole site. I'm going to, I'm going to frame this for you, okay. but obviously an American marriage is, um, you know, set as you talked about with, um, with uh, Roy going to prison, right. And, 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 um, and innocent. Lee. And so talk to us a little bit. You talked to us initially about the sort of inspiration, right, of the grocery store, but you also talked to us about the research you were doing at Harvard. And so can you talk to us a little bit about the question is, in doing your research for the novel, what sources did you lean towards? And I'm gonna, I know that you talked about art, right, and, and, and the difference between being inspired artistically and then the um, sort of, you know, nuts and bolts of incarceration. And it says, uh, but tell us a little bit about how your understanding of incarceration um, then, you know, led to the text. And then there is a profound, fitting, yet unexpected plot twist in the middle of the novel. How did you come to that idea? And just so we know this, this is from Iman Young. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm a big fan of your work. Oh, well, first, thank you. That plot twist, it shocked me as much as it shocked anybody. I mean, that's the thing about when I write a novel, I have to just follow the story. But when that plot twist happened, Roy thought he was shocked. I was shocked. I was like, get out. However, you know, one thing I did know, I think this is my research, was my research percolating in the back of my mind is that, you know, the number one indicator that you'll go to prison, your dad's in prison. That's the number one indicator. So there you go. Because sometimes people are like, is that possible? Lots of people meet their relatives in prison lots of people. But um, I look to oral history. I mean, I did a lot of research, like, you know, I read The New Jim Crow, like everybody in the world, I've read Just Mercy. And I can tell you though, when you read a lot of nonfiction and you're writing fiction, you have to fight with every fiber in your body for the characters not to like turn and say, did you know that, you know, in some <laughs> statistic, like you just, you want to, cause you know the statistic, you'll be trying to work the statistic in there. And that was really difficult because like for example, where Roy works is an agri prison. And so he has part of his job is picking soybeans. And there was part of me that wanted to demonstrate this black man in modern day picking soybeans, you know, like he's picking cotton. And, but every time I tried to write that scene, it was like me turning to the camera being like, did you know that in this day and age, people are working in conditions very similar to slavery. And I had to just pull back, you just have to fight that urge. But the oral it's history- not a PSA, in other words. So easy. You just want to, because you know it. When you know it, you want others to know it. But the thing that was most helpful were the oral histories, because I did not want to go to real people in prison and, and say, hey, I'm writing a book. Can you hook me up with some local color? Like, you don't want to be that person. But when I read the oral histories, people who participate in oral history projects, they want the details of their lives out there. They want to be a source for research. And that's just a whole, for me, ethically a different thing. And so when I was reading, um, there's an oral history project from McSweeney's called Surviving Justice. It's about people who've been 
in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And one thing that was really striking to me is that they didn't spend that much time being like, I didn't do it, I'm innocent because they were not, they were very interested in blurring the lines between the so-called wrongfully imprisoned and everyone else. Because when you say wrongfully imprisoned, it implies that others are rightfully imprisoned. And just think if you've been in prison 25 years, that's your, those are your people. Like you want, you want everybody out. You want, and you are more likely to be an abolitionist than to say, let us, because this whole, it's kind of a, a version of respectability. Oh, we're going to let out these people. You know, even the question with nonviolent drug offenders, you know, those are everybody's favorite people to say let out of prison, but there's so many people in prison for so many things that or don't fall into that category, but also deserve amnesty, deserve mercy. So this was something that really, it really got in my head when I was working on it. And also another thing that was going on when I was writing this toward the end was when, you know, the question of Me Too. Sometimes people ask me, how do you square Me Too with this novel about a man wrongfully in prison for a sexual assault? But I think that me too is not, this is a strange, this woman was attacked by a stranger. Roy was misidentified, which is really different than lied on, even though she's wrong and it wasn't him. But me too is a lot about when people are assaulted by people they know. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you come to work and your boss is naked, you know exactly who he is. You're not confused. This is not faulty, even racist eyewitness, right? Eyewitnesses are the worst, you know, and racist eyewitness identifications get people of color locked up for yeah. sure. But that, I don't think that is not really where Me Too is. Me Too is not about the strangers in that same way. I mean, it, it is under the umbrella, but most of it is about holding people accountable and you know exactly who they are. Thank you. So the next couple of questions, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put them together. So there's a question about how you tell the story. So I think with the, uh, this is from Debbie Weiss. And so it's, can you, can Tiara tell us about how she determined, uh, how, like the breakup, right? I think she means sort of, right, you have different chapters, different sections, um, and it's told in a series, she's talking about the series, American Marriage Told in a um, series of different characters. So how do you make those choices? And then the, the follow-up question to that, which is also about the process and how it's related to the question that Michael John Carley has asked, which is about that sometimes people have said, he was just referencing um, an interview with you and I'll have to get back to the top here. Uh, and it was in the LA Review of Books podcast. And um, and it's that he's saying that um, it's some, some people have described it as painful to read, right? Uh, the book. The book, and um, and so the question here is about diff uh, reception, right? How people have received the book. So tell us a little bit about how you choose to write the book, and then talk to us a little bit about the reception of the book. My original impulse was to write this book entirely from the point of view of Celestia. I'm a woman. I'm an artist. I hadn't seen very many depictions of Black women artists in literature. And I was into it and I was writing about her and people kept saying, well, what about her husband? What about her husband? Then I got defensive and I felt like I have a lot of men friends who are writers and they write about men and no one has ever told a man, what about his wife? We need some chapters from the point of view of his wife. And then they said, well, yes, but her husband's in prison. And then I felt really frustrated. Like this is a thing like black women's stories because because men are suffering racism in, in this violent way, in this carceral way, it makes women's stories seem less important. So no, you can't make me. But then the thing about being a writer, unlike being a painter, let's say you're a painter, you're painting your painting and someone suggests a change and you make the change in your painting, you can never have your original back. You've changed that painting forever. But as a writer, you can try anything. You have your original draft. The only thing that's keeping you from not trying something is you just hard headed. So you have to, I had to write, as I say, write with a humble pen. I had to humble myself and try to write from the point of view of Roy. And so I wrote the book from the rooter to the tutor from the point of view of Roy. So now I got a full book from the point of view of Celestial, a full book from the point of view of Roy. Roy's, I wrote it like that. And I said, why, how can I write it like that? But it's because that's a story I already knew you know, one, a black man has been done wrong by the system and he just wants to come back and find a faithful woman and a clean house. I knew that story already. 
And I didn't want to just write a black reboot of the Odyssey because that's basically what that is. So I took their two stories and toggled them. I took some from this stack, some from, I took like the highlights from each person's point of view. So there's like 200 pages on the floor, but I, and then I said, okay, I like it. But Roy felt so boxed in because every time he did something, it felt like he was the black man. It's like, are you saying the black man is destined to go to prison? Are you saying that even if the black man gets an education, the black man will go to prison? Are you saying the black man? It was too much. And just like in real life, when you're the only one in the room, you become symbolic and, and less actual. So when I added Andre as a third point of view person, there were two black men. If they're two black men, nobody can be the black man. They became Roy and Andre. And it just gave them more room to, it gave them more room to be. Now, what was the other? Uh, the other question was about the uh, perception, uh, how how different readers have received the book, particularly uh, uh, across racial lines. That's what the question's asking. Um, I I don't know if this book. I remember that guy talking about this book. That was a crazy interview. Whoever you are out there, and did you follow up the next day when we did the thing in person? It was a lot, but. <laughs> this book is too painful. I think that's another way that people have of shutting out writers of color by telling you your story is too painful. You know, it, it is not. This book is actually a little bit funny. It's kind of funny. Because I have to say, if you haven't read it, it's really, it's funny, it's engaging, it's witty. It's the full range of what people experience. And that's the thing, people, exp every, any book, if it's any good, is going to have some painful parts. It's going to have some funny parts. But uh, yeah, when he said that, I wanted to, I, I, yeah, I, you bet. It was a podcast. You didn't see my podcast. We just got, it was a weird combo. So the yes. ag agreement, yes. I mean, when he said that, I was looking at him like, we're on this podcast to try to encourage people to read this book, not to tell people it's going to be painful. But people have responded. Some people respond in different ways, like there's, when I write a novel, I imagine there are two audiences. I figure there's like, you know, like a record. There's the A side and there's the B side. And you have to, the A, one side is gonna be writing for people who know this experience intimacy, intimately. And the B side is for people who don't know, but need to know. And you have to, this, well, you see which one I made A and B. I was gonna say, you have to decide which is gonna be the A and which is gonna be the B. And so I make the A side to people who know the experience. And one of the things I want them to walk away from the book is to feel like there is a way forward. See, I think when you're writing for the B side, the people who don't know, you have this impulse to make it as bad as possible so they can see this incarceration thing is serious. Call your congressman. You made it just, it's unsurmountable. But imagine if you are the person that's incarcerated and you read this book and I'm suggesting there's no hope because I need the B-side people to act. I'm gonna depress the people who need to, who see themselves. So I balance that. And there are some readers who want, some people complain, I see them on the Goodreads. They're like, they wanted more racism. It wasn't enough racism. I'm like, you want a lot of, you want some racism? Walk outside. <laughs> you go the they got a lot of racism over there. A lot of racism. You need a little more a racism, racism everywhere. <laughs> but it's almost like they were disappointed that it wasn't more devastating. But I mean, it's devastating enough, I think. Um, abroad, I'm very interested in like, I brought, I have some copies of the book. Can I show them? Like yeah, this I was just about to ask that question. Great. We're, I got three. So this is the international question. So let's talk okay. about that. This is the American cover. This is the cover in the UK. And this is the cover in Brazil. I kind of like this one, it's kind of cool. And you see how the American, an, an American marketing technique is if you're a black writer and your work is important or serious, they don't put people on the cover. I remember I was told with Silver Sparrow, you know, like we don't want to ghettoize this book by putting a black face on the front of this book. And I was like, y'all realize I have a black face on the front of my head. <laughs> I was like, you are hurting my feelings. Is my face ghettoizing the rest of my body? Like, what are you doing? There? <laughs> but there's this sense that they need to make sure people know that it's not only for black people. But in the in the in the um, European editions, here's um, I think this is Czech. Mm -hmm. But they the you know the race is emphasized, which is probably like, as I was saying um, to Ati before we got started. I was saying I think it's probably racist just in a different way. <laughs> Like, but I do prefer the, the covers with the people on them. But one thing I have noticed in the US, people say, this is wrongful incarceration thing. It's a real problem in the South. Everybody wants to 
um, uh -huh. quarantine the racism. It's over there. So then when I go over abroad, they're like, we don't understand American racism. It's so terrible. While I'm looking at how they treat their immigrants, their immigrants might be from the Middle East, but it's the same thing. But everyone wants to believe that anti-Blackness and racism is, is over yonder somewhere. Yeah, That's what I have noticed. Everyone is like, it's not here. Thank you again. And so we have exactly like three minutes left. So I'm going to ask you exactly a, a okay, sort ready. of roundup question. Okay, I'm ready. Which is, people want to know how you take care of yourself. Okay. They want to know what books you are reading are on your shelves besides your own. Okay. And they want to know about this next new book, right? Your next novel. So can you do that in three minutes? And I yes, I can answer the question. She has led new writers to publishers. Go. <laughs> okay, yeah, I have led, but I only lead people to publishers when their book is done. Done, done, done. When you've done everything you can do, that's when I step in because I want the story to be yours and not to be crafted by the business. So yes, I have, I have done that. It can be done. Publishers, agents, they're always looking for new stuff. Um, Taking care of self, what do you do? I turn no screens after like 9.30. I got to okay. go to bed in a peaceful way. And, and I, do we, not, I do not charge my phone by my bed. I'm not, I don't want it by my head. And okay. I happen to know you get up early when there's nobody to bother you too. Yes, I get up very early. I like to feel like the day is mine and I do my writing in the morning and I do the other things. I also clean up my writing room before I go to bed. So when I wake up, it's a very peaceful place. Also for self-care, find a clean place in your house so that you have a little sanctuary spot, even if it's just a corner of a room, a place where you can retreat to, particularly since we're trapped indoors. What books are you reading that you are find at this moment? Um, I just read The Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans. It was amazing. Um, I'm dying for someone to give me an ARC of The Rib King by Lady Hubbard. Hint, hint out there, I think it's, um, Penguin Random House, hook me up. Okay. And last question. Give us a teaser. Give us a teaser about this next book. I'm writing a novel about a woman who comes back to Atlanta from New York, but check this. She moves into the same house she grew up in, but she's a local girl made good. The neighborhood where she grew up in has been gentrified. So the house where she grew up, where it was like cut into a bunch of apartments and it was, you know, kind of shabby, is now like fabulously renovated Victorian. The question is, can you gentrify your own neighborhood? Can black people be gentrifiers? The question is, kind of. All right. Thank you so much. So this is literally my last question, which is some of us saw in the press that there it may be an opportunity to see some of these things. It seems like Oprah and Issa Rae have some things they want to do with these. So tell us a little bit about that project of taking a text to the screen. The most I'm work I'm doing some writing on these projects myself. The biggest question is, what does that look like? Because like when you write a novel, you're like, what does that feel like? What does that think like? You got to say, what does that look? What does jealousy look like? What does disappointment look like? You have you got to do visual storytelling, and of course, the excitement of casting. I've been watching a lot of television for homework. Like, did you know that the pilot? of a TV show has everybody in it that's gonna be in it over the long haul. Like you have to think how to get every person who's gonna be from beginning to end has to like at least pop up and do one character defining thing. So it's kind of like when I'm writing novels, I say these one sentence portraits. Like I wrote a one sentence portrait of someone to say, she's the kind of woman that would not share her recipes. So you're a specific kind of person. You got to figure out what is the visual thing you can do that tells a story. We're excited for the next novel. Thank you, professor, Thank you. author, rock star, novelist. Tiari Jones, I cannot thank you enough for being with us today. We're getting really good feedback in the chat and in the Q&A. Thank you to all of you who joined us here today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules for this conversation. I think we've learned a lot. And I think one of the things I'm gonna take away is about art and inspiration, right? 
Uh, and so I don't know about anybody else, but I've been inspired and I'm going to go back and reread some of these books. So as Tiari reminds us, go to your library, borrow the book, buy the book, download it on Kindle, all the books, all of them. They are amazing. And we have another one to look forward to. And as was just announced, we have some screen time we'll probably be doing. So again, everyone, take good care out of there, out there, take care of yourselves. Remember the oxygen masks. And remember, we've got a lot of great work to do out there. And as Tiara has reminded us, right, these issues that her book references and also the way in which we think about family, home, community, love, relationships, we have opportunities to do better and to be better to one another. So let's take those opportunities and move ahead. Thank you, Tiara Jones. I am thrilled you were here with us today. Thanks for having me, it was terrific. Thank you to my team behind the scenes and everybody who made this possible. Thank you to the participants. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And we will sign off now.